thank you thank you for inviting me here uh, amit has been very kind in introducing me and his my prior interactions with him have been really thought provoking in various sense the way he has been bringing together the management education institutes and always providing the leading edge where the future of the management education is going to be how regulators are going to be interacting with them and the overall ecosystem in which, in which we are going to thrive now having said that as we are talking about the disruptive era like uh, somitra here i also do not have a background in a management i learned management in a management school i also have a phd from computer science so i started my career as a computer science i also started working in a computer science era a area and for about uh, 15 years i worked as a computer science at goddard space flight center of nasa and then also part of that period i spent with cybase massively pro parallel processor group or cybase mpp and the reason i bring about because somitra had started with a very wonderful uh, example that how growth of it has disrupted the world and the pace at which it's gro growing and his example of a lake was a wonderful that the speed at which the lake gets filled while the in initial impact takes long time for it to be visible the it has grown at that pace i used to work at goddess space flight center of nasa which was actually the unit which collected all the satellite whatever downstream data and used to analyze and we had a parallel processing system there these parallel processing computers sitting there used to take days to analyze only about a terabyte of a data right few days before they could come up and that's why a ozone hole actually which was their data was of about 6 years old we got to analyze that 6 years later because the data downloaded from satellites was so much that it took that long period of time and then this parallel computer realized there's a ozone hole has been developing in this reason and so is the uh, so was the scenario today the same kind of computing power we carry in our mobiles modern mobile processor has all more than more cpu speed than that eras parallel computers remember that cray xmp which was banned in india or us has used to bar because we will develop the nuclear technology if we get access to the parallel computers right so non friendly countries or non western countries or non nato countries were not allowed that technology we developed our own param but today that param sits on everybody's desktop that's the power of computing today now this actually says that impact is going to be felt or not has already been seen in the industry many examples are there and much of the introduction to that talk has been given by somitra's talk that how ai and robotics etc are making the difference but the fact remains that disruption happens not only from a technological perspective from another perspective there are two types of disruptions which happen which also are applicable to the education sector first type of disruption which happens is always from a low end player who is working in a incremental domain a great example of that is us steel industry was not killed or did not die because of the sudden abrupt changes in the technology of that nature which it is talking about today or another plane which was developed that technology has shifted to another plane it was the only incremental technology if you notice the way we behave the large companies or large incumbent players behave is the reason the companies end up or businesses end up not being sustainable if you take the example of steel industry and off repeated example many of you have seen any time you read the history of a death of a steel industry in us is exactly you read the same story that initially there were large plants all very successful all very profitable making four types of products that the bottom was a reinforcement steel bar mixed with the concrete laid in your buildings then there were angle products 
and then H bar and I bars, and on top was a specialized steel, which was actually the most profitable part. Typically, these reinforced bars, etc., do not have much uh, profitability, but you have to make that product because market supply has to be made by somebody or produced by somebody. It's the specialized steels which have a huge margins of 30, 40 percent, and everybody would like to make that. Now, there was a development of mini steel plants. So some younger player who could not afford that kind of investment decided to have a mini furnaces, take the scrap from the marketplace, melt it, and convert into reinforcement or rebars. And the consequence was what? They could do it at an almost 20% lower cost than the larger steel mills. Their quality was horrible. If you really test it against the quality produced by large steel mills, I don't think they matched up. But the way marketplace worked, it was available, and there was a new set of consumers who could not afford that, and they also wanted to build the cost of buildings down. Then on top of that, you know what happens with the restructuring uh, bar or a reinforcement bars, they get buried in concrete. So once buried in concrete, the builders started using it, because who will be able to test them? It's not an exposed steel anymore. Right. So they begin to buy the cheaper product. Now, the larger player looked at it, and they realized 20% lower cost, we can't compete. Our profit margins are anywhere only about 3 to 5% in that product. So they decided to yield that space. They said, why should we be in that business at all? It's not a profitable business. And it's for us, and let them do it. So mini steel bars popped up one after another, and tens of them. And these people moved up to angle production, I bar and H bar production, and the specialized steels. Now, once they moved out of this space, these mini steel mills were competing with each other. Now they're cost cutting and competing at equal, not with the large players. So that price competition brought their margins down, and they found themselves they're not very profitable. So they decided, is the same furnace, why can't I make the angle product out of it? Now, angle product, they started making at 20% lower cost. The furnace is same, little change in processes, and you can do it. Reaction of large players, as usual, 20% lower cost, we can't match it. Profit margins are about 8% rather than 3 to 5%, now 8%. Give up this product, let's move further up. I bar and v H bars, as well as the specialized steels. Exact same scenario followed. They moved out, and then these people began to manufacture the angle product, and again the competition when was only between them, the problem happened. And they decided, we can now expand capacity. We have created accu enough accumulated wealth with us. We can also do I bars and H bars. And they moved to the third level of the product. Further reaction was what? This product has about 50, 12 to 15 percent of profitability, but the specialized still have 35 percent of profitability. Why don't we become more efficient and more profitable? Give up this product as well. And they gave up that product. Now, same story repeats after that. The specialized steel was the only one they were left. Story which started in 60s and 70s, by the time late 80s came, the, st the mini steel mills became large enough for a medium-sized steel mills, and they started making specialized steel also. Consequences. The last steel, large steel plant, Bethlehem Steel, was also driven out of the business. Incumbent players always keep moving up in the profitability because lower end products are never profitable. And younger players continue to disrupt them because they willingly give up, give up that market. And this story continues years after years. You look at the story of Toyota versus General Motors. Same thing, from a large cars to a tiny, not so reliable or not so fancy Corona, terrestrial, 
then Corolla, and on and on, and GM kept moving up, and they looked at these and said, these tiny players, hardly very profitable. I, don't, I want to be in a luxury business. But Toyota is a luxury car maker today and has occupied and owns GM in reverse uh, shareholding. Right? So incumbent players are always, but then even if you want to register that, it's a very difficult task. And that's why you see US lost its competitiveness to Japan, Japan lost its competitiveness in manufacturing all these products to later to Korea and then to China and on and on the story goes on and today India can be occupying the same space or is trying to occupy the same space. So that's how larger and smaller players work. Education, large players always stand at a receiving end. Because younger player can always pick up the unserved market space by creating a low-end product. But fortunately, if you see, the story doesn't get repeated here. Harvard still remains Harvard. Stanford still remains Stanford. Oxford still remains Oxford. They have not been able to create that. Reason is twofold. One. If you are a great undergraduate school, right? If you see the same tiers of product, re, re bars of, and angles and so on, the high end product and low end product, it doesn't work that way. If I have a great undergraduate school, my set of teachers and my set of faculty is going to be of one type. I cannot move them up and create a great graduate school of, out of that. Unlike a steel mill, where the same furnace can be used and upgraded from one type of product to another type of product. You require a different kind of assets or resources in order for us to grow up. And that's why you see this young undergraduate schools have never been able to challenge the graduate schools because they have gathered a graduate uh, faculty which is at a graduate level very competent and undergraduate schools are unable to move up in that line. So that's the advantage always we had against the sustainable business schools, uh, against the sustaining against the smaller business schools. Also, the faculty is a most important resource. It's not like everybody can acquire the same furnace. If Harvard has collected a set of faculty or Stanford has collected a set of faculty, it's not the same anybody can replicate. If I am Ahmedabad has a set of faculty, it can't be replicated by another school because over a period has created an ecosystem and that ecosystem can have that faculty. So it, first part of that disruption which has been caused does not apply in the education sector because of these reasons. And we have had deriving great advantage of that. The second set of disruptions which uh, as I said Swamitra was referring to in the technology terms are something we need to experiment and worry about. Because there's a huge set of a marketplace which is underserved. And especially the cost of education has been going up tremendously. Right? Today, MBA cost on average $100,000 and even a lot more than that. Even in India, I think it's uh, anywhere from 20 lakhs and upward, which is a significant amount to be shelling out from the pocket. Second, the usefulness of that education comes from two parts. One is that quality of faculty which is delivering it, and second is the network which is giving the advantage to the ex existing schools that they have the network or a peer network or an alum network which are going to take advantage of. So these are the two advantages they have. But information technology is going to cause a great disruption and has been causing a disruption because the way it's been growing. As we talked about, information technology is changing the actual classroom scenario. We are not talking about a classroom that an internet or a telephone or a disrupting line or a disturbing line we are delivering the content. Today we can imagine or visualize a classroom where a deep level of interaction happens between the multiple players. The teacher, the students, Corona taught us, even accelerated the process in the meantime. 
And when it accelerated the process, we already saw that acceleration happening, that most of them adopted and were able to deliver on the Indian public net infrastructure, quality of delivery was reasonably stable. And as already referred to Moore's law, what does it say? The processing power will double itself every 18 months. Right. Then the Crider's law says the storing power will double every, every 16 months. And then there's a network's law which says every nine months will double the bandwidth. So if you had a quality problem of a network bandwidth problem, the bandwidth availability to you has doubled over a period of only. And when you look at that perspective, if you could earlier you required the dedicated lines or a campus infrastructure in order to deliver, today your mobile moving from 3G to 4G and 5G has the same kind of bandwidth available, which can deliver the instructions in the same kind of environment. The cost being a major structure, many a people are unable or being pushed out of the management education. A growing country like India cannot do with what I call not more than three to 5,000 quality management graduates coming out of the Indian management schools. Yes, we have hundreds of management schools, but truly available in the marketplace are not more than three to 5,000 quality management graduates. If we believe we are going to be a five trillion economy, may not be next three years, but maybe next five, now from, on, from next five years, we'll be able to sustain, the, our output has not grown to the same extent. So a huge amount of re, Skilling of existing managers, ex existing engineers, has to be done immediately. And that pressure, that pressure which has been put on us provides a great opportunity for business schools who are able to do it. Right? Fundamental part with that is the quality is going to be maintained or not. Now, if you have seen, many of these places have launched, that's why, what you call the e-education program. The e-MBAs, which have been launched in India, quality is of varying quality. As a young management institute called IM Raipur, which I was heading, actually in 2018, and I would say, other than IIM uh, Cozy Code, which had its a huge satellite-based network prog uh, MBA program, we were the first one to launch in India called D2D, device-to-device -device program, because I realized from a Raipur to get ahead of IM Ahmedabad or be in the league of ABC is not going to be a possibility. Or it may take two or three decades for them not to do so well and for us to do extremely well. So we decided there has to be a change of philosophy. And our change of philosophy was that we need to establish ourselves where the market is going to be. Rather than chasing the dream, let's believe where the ball is going to be in the future. And we believed in IM Raipur because we built a smart campus, which is a, one of the state-of-the-art network campus or a network infrastructure campus. We said we leverage on that infrastructure and we launched our programs. Massive amount of uh, innovations we did, starting from executive education initially. We ran the first digital marketing program. We ran senior management program. We said senior management program, I am Ahmedabad runs, and it's a very popular and huge queue of people comes, and they're unable to accommodate all of them. Doesn't matter, we'll offer at half the price of I am Ahmedabad in online because our cost structures are going to be so low. And whoever is unable to make it there will make it in I am Raipur. And we had more than 300 to 400 people vying, and we used to take about 100 people in each program. So we also got a not a problem, but an opportunity where you could select people rather than anybody who wants to do my senior management program could do it. Same thing happened, and that's why, encouraged by all that, we did EMBA program, and 2019 itself we launched the program, and 21 first batches graduated. Uh, and we used to have about 1,200 applications. With a proper selection, we used to take 200 candidates only. Right? Nobody stops us from actually taking our 1,000. 
the scalability of that model is so strong. But we decided initially we want our product to be getting the traction in the marketplace will cre create a little scarcity or a challenge that it's not available for everyone. You still have to compete in order to get that program. But later we would, any time we want, we can open and scale it to that extent. So that was our objective uh, in that sense. If you see in the education sector, that's why two universities, or I say three universities, have been pioneer in the US. There was a, I, when I used to travel in metro, sometimes commuting to my work, uh, or the, the, that metro is called BART, they used to have a board, and we used to kind of take it, take it as a funny, which kind of university is this? University of Phoenix. We used to believe, and some normally minority are those uh, people as a student showing there. And they had a distant or whatever, a different kind of program. And everybody said, what kind of university? Maybe some useless university putting their uh, advertisement on Metro, et cetera, and so on. Today, University of Phoenix is causing a wonderful disruption in the marketplace. It has 135,000 enrollments. Many universities in the US are while struggling for enrollment. What they have done is the technology advanced in these 20 or 30 years now. They continue to keep pace with the technology. And today they create the most wonderful classrooms with the animated lectures. And they say, we don't, don't worry about who we have as professors. The professors are available in top universities. We get them. Some of them just retired, some of them younger some of them available as a gig worker. So they take their classes, make them teach, record it, and then embellish with their movie making capability. Meaning that all that animation, etc., which they add to it, that it becomes very explainable even to the common person. And their classroom, that's why, if you only deliver your lecture and they record it, and once they embellish it with their own technology, and show it to you, you will not believe I use, that this is me teaching so lucidly to the people and be able to explain the toughest con concept in the simplest form. Using technology, they have done it, and they're very popular amongst the people who cannot reach an afford. First, they may not be able to reach because of the scores, et cetera, that's a, the filtering model, but more importantly, may not, be, may not be able to reach because of the... <coughs> uh, because of, uh, because of the fees which are involved in these uh, schools of 100,000, et cetera, and so on. Another business school, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a very famous university for computer science people. Actually, their business school had only 114 with a great difficulty cohort program MBA admissions. And about four or five, now about five years ago, they tied up with Coursera, what they are called, they offered IMBA over the net. Few times you have to go to the campus. All other instructions are online. Similar technology available, delivered over a wide variety of bandwidth available to you. Great interaction. And the cost of program is only $20,000. Today, they run a class of somewhere between 1200 to 1500 because they still don't want to expand the classes beyond that. So a class of from 114, they have scaled up to 1200. And it's the same school, which was, I would say, middle rung school in a business uh, uh, category, not uh, top 20 or top 25. It was somewhere below that. But they are also challenging these schools. And the newer challenges are coming from these kind of schools. There's also West Governors University, which is a very experimental university, has about 110,000 incumbents. Idea is a lots of Stanford professors, lots of Berkeley professors who have retired recently on lots of industry people who have a great knowledge of their domain knowledge of their subject, who are reasonably good teachers and they've converted and doing that. Some of you have noticed the same kind of thing being done by Upgrade in India, the Rani Skruwala's company, right? They also record a lecture and they embellish and because they're movie makers, so they put lots of animation, simplification of concept, experimentation with the students, whether they understood the concept, et cetera, or not. So they prepare material to that extent. 
that's where lies the future of future challenge for a incumbent educational institute as it advances believe me 5 years or at the speed it works otherwise i've said maybe a decade from now but the way it works and disrupts maybe 5 years from now we may see a meta verse like classrooms where actually you have a virtual classroom but you are interacting in a digital world in a virtual environment one on one with the students feeling the students getting feeling they are sitting in a real classroom and you getting the same kind of a feeling right this time during the international yoga day we have a startup company within our incubation system these people have created a virtual reality glasses and loaded the software and while we were doing uh, on international yoga day yoga in iim uh, ahmedabad but we all put those glasses on and we felt that we are sitting somewhere in himalayas <laughs> right <laughs> so the technology is available it may be expensive not scalable you can't provide each student taking uh, admission today but the way it cost go down few years down the line you will see that cost going down and the virtual classes or auditorium of the same kind will be created and we will be having classes of that nature that's there lies the biggest challenge of disruption because the cost will be lower reach will be higher and the environment will be as good and the classes will be curated now what you do what uh, i think uh, somito was talking about in a modeling lecture is that outside or within organization setting a unit and doing your experimentation so at i am ahmedabad we are doing our own experimentation we have formed already a unit and we are already have pumped in uh, we have a budget of about 30 crores but we have pumped in into that already about 10 crores and created a it infrastructure to serve such kind of a market in future right the experiment may succeed or fail but in the process will provide education to lots of people and will recover our cost no matter what because india is a different kind of a marketplace unlike west we have a huge amount of students and the name of i am ahmedabad online or offline people are willing to pay right so our smp in ahmedabad this year is onward we have made in both modes you come physically for that many months and spend with us or you can do in a blended mode where you come for one week in the beginning one week of the end rest is a virtual delivery to you we have launched programs in dubai similar nature one week we'll go and teach you in dubai one week you'll come to ahmedabad and learn here and rest of the program is virtual and we call it our i am dubai i am amdabad dubai center programs right so we are investing as well as already reaping the benefits of that we created three experiments there because we had to figure it out which models will work and which will not work because these were the programs we knew are automatically going to work even we do it in a blended mode so we first then experimented that if you go for the mooc kind of education and offer our programs so we created two programs and since we did not have the social media marketing wing till then established with us so we said let's partner with coursera so we partnered with the coursera model and this one program is about human resource or leadership and other program is what we call pre mba statistics i think we have broken the all records of coursera with our leadership program 200000 plus was the registration or a takers of that program about one and a half month ago when i last checked i think it may have crossed about 250 to 300000 already right and that's why coursera came and already rewarded my professor that the best course in the coursera and with the feedback of 9 out of 10 9 plus out of 10 because they only reward who have a 9 plus feedback second course pmba statistics actually was launched toward all other mba schools in india our target was india there that those who would like to sample what is the minimum statistics knowledge they should have and their business schools may not be imparting so students can take that on their own we have already done that by adding and we have close to about 90000 so close to 1 crore participants sorry 1 lakh participants 90000 so close to 1 lakh participants already in that 
and their model is very simple, 3,000 for certificate, so to all 250,000 or 90,000 are not going to give, give us any money, but our conversion rate has been 15%. So you can uh, now add up the revenue, right? 30,000 certificates at 3,000 each, 50% Coursera will take, but 50% is mine. So each program is giving us crores of revenue. And this will keep giving because the participants will keep coming. But that was the experiment. And then there was an old time faculty because large schools, incumbent schools always have a problem of moving to one dimension, one direction to another. So some believe that this MOOC and asynchronous is not something. We are the star professors and I'm talking about really star professors whose courses are known around the country who teach supply chain, not as a supply chain, but they call it elephants and cheetah. <laughs> right? So their courses are well known around the country called, you know, I'm taking elephants and cheetah. Right? So they decided that it can't be delivered. I'm an old timer. I need to have an interaction with my class. So we said, okay, we'll also experiment because we need to experiment. Maybe that model will work. So we also offered a synchronous model. And we said one lakh fee. Because in a synchronous model, the actual delivery will happen, et cetera, and so on. Unlike a virtual model, we have recorded once and you keep playing whenever you feel like. Hasn't succeeded that much. It has succeeded in terms of revenue, et cetera. It's giving back, but getting about 30, 40 registrations. Because one like is a steep price. And synchronous is that timing-wise, everybody is not free to come at whatever time they want to come. There's a window, and if I miss that class, I believe I paid one like, and now I miss one class, right? Directly gone from my pocket certain money. So two courses we launched, and by both very popular professors of uh, IIM Ahmedabad, both have done reasonably well. So we also have experimented that synchronous is not, marketplace is not ready for the synchronous uh, play, play market, etc. The last thing we are doing is that we are, as I said, we are investing and created our own online at IMA platform. And all future courses, we have also created our social media marketing wing. So we'll also continue some courses with Coursera, but we are launching all our courses on our own. We are launching our business analytics program, which is a diploma in business analytics, also on the same platform. So we are launching diploma programs, certificate programs, as well as the degree program, our EMBA program, which will be starting in 24 because our processes, as I said, incumbent school doesn't move like a cheetah, it moves like elephant only. So we'll move like elephant, and by 24 we'll be launching that program. And that's why we're also preparing because when the disruption happens, I am Ahmedabad is going to be ready to have that wing which will sustain us and again provide us that leadership role to guide this country in being where we want to be. Thank you very much.